10 teaching days. Frank is going to perform that magic. And um, if you've had a look at the material, I'm sure you'll, you'll see that it's, it's not a difficult trick. The materials are excellent. Frank, uh, of course, is uh, extremely well known in the debtor-creditor field. He didn't teach me debtor-creditor in 1971, but I think he was uh, probably teaching somebody at that point. Frank is now a partner at Castles, Brock and Blackwell. He heads up their insolvency and bankruptcy section. Uh, his practice is restricted, as I said, to insolvency, bankruptcy, receiverships, and general debtor-creditor. Uh, I'm sure he's well known to you as the author of a very authoritative text on receiverships. Um, what you may not know is that he has dragged the bar admission course uh, debtor-creditor section into the uh, perhaps the 1990s, if I can be that presumptuous. You'll find the materials here are bright and, and easy to read in a very useful manual. I can tell you that the students who participate in the program on a non-voluntary basis <laughs> Uh, give very positive feedback about the, the whole experience. It's a good program and Frank deserves a lot of credit. He of course heads up that section. He's also chairman of the insolvency section of the Canadian Bar Association. Uh, he will be starring in the fall in a program on PPSA and I'm sure you've heard uh, rumors about new legislation and uh, I'm told the rumors, uh, there's substance to those rumors and Frank perhaps will be dropping some hints later on about what's going to happen but um, we'll leave that to Frank. So Frank, it's a well pleasure to uh, welcome you and turn the program over to you. Thank you, Joel. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the wonderful world of creditor and debtor. Uh, this program is designed for the general practitioner. We're going to cover many different topics this morning and this afternoon with the view of how to rather than review of substantive law. And the various speakers have been requested to prepare uh, review and checklists in the specific areas covering uh, the law of debtor and uh, creditor. Um, you have two three ring binders. One uh, binder contains the bar mission course materials and what I'd like to do is just take you through it very quickly. You can all unwrap your plastic to know what's in there because eventually it'll get on your shelf and you're going to wonder what's in it. The other binder contains the review and checklist from which uh, the speakers will be speaking about. Um, the actual textbook material uh, was written by me over a period of time, about eight or nine years, and it contains some of my um, lectures and materials that appear elsewhere. But if you look at the first uh, table of contents, you can see what it covers in, in rather uh, great detail. Debt enforcement for the general litigator is involved in debt collection. And it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you have to be involved in collection of debts. You're going to get uh, contract, breach of contracts, whether it be uh, leases or debentures or just sale of goods. So it gives you a, a review of debt collection through the judicial process. Chapter 2 gives you other types of debtor-creditor relief statutes uh, which come into play, uh, Assignment and uh, Preferences Act, Fraudulent Conveyances Act, Absconding Debtors Act. Wages Act, uh, these are all types of acts that are involved in the post-judgment collection. And then there's pre-judgment remedies, as you, as you know, um, or even junctions, certificates of pending litigation. Um, that's Chapter 2. Chapter 3 is a unique chapter, debtors' rights. Uh, it was designed because uh, many years ago we took one side to creditors' rights all the time. Now we have debtors' rights. Um, it's a different type of chapter focusing on what debtors can do in, in delaying defeating creditors' rights. It also covers uh, exemptions, provincial and federal exemptions. So when the sheriff comes to the debtor's door, what can be seized? And that's important because it's good for you as a, perhaps as a general practitioner in planning wills, in planning uh, state planning, um, planning corporations, uh, generally uh, making sure what uh, type of assets can be, can be attached. Chapter 4 is the middle part of the bar admission course and it's where I think the law is in the 1980s and what's going to be in the 1990s. It's the law of secured transactions and it covers in a general way different types of secured transactions, debentures, Bank Act security, PPSA, Quebec goods, 30-day goods. Um, that is very important because under proposed legislation under Bankruptcy Act. It's going to be the rights of secured creditors all the way. There's going to be a new PPSA as we know soon, sooner than later now. 
um, and creditors are taking security instead of acting as trade creditors. And of course, when the debtor is insolvent, uh, you're going to stand at a higher ranking position than that of the uh, trade creditor or the unsecured judgment creditor. So that's where the law, I think, is going to move into the 1990s. So it's a very important area. From that area um, comes specialty types of, of rights, such as uh, the landlord and tenant. And that's what Chapter 5 is all about. Uh, two main areas, and Steve Posen is going to cover that, two main areas in the sense of landlords can distrain uh, for arrears of rent and the tenant can apply for relief from forfeiture in the event that the landlord locks out the tenant. And those are two very important commercial uh, rights of landlord and tenant. Chapter 6 is construction liens, and I think it's everything you want to know, subject to what Joel Rickler will tell you later on this morning, in an average uh, practice of what, what is the Construction Lien Act and how you file a lien. And from there, you can always hire a specialist or work with a specialist. But it's enough for you to understand the area, and I think it's in more simplified language than it used to be. Chapter 7 is a chapter on mortgage remedies. At the end of the chapter, page 101, if you will, there's a comparison between the power of sale and foreclosure. And uh, as many, many of you know, foreclosure is rather passe in the 1980s, and power of sale is the state of the art. And it has its problems in procedure. It has its problems in selling for bona fide value to a third-party purchaser. And uh, Martin Stamber will tell you more about that a little later. Um, chapters 8 and 9 are the PPSA today, and they are, I think, comprehensive chapters dealing with what is the PPSA, its exceptions, carving it out, and of course, default, the basic remedies of a secured creditor, secured party under PPSA. Martin uh, Black is coming from Ottawa to tell you how he reviews a security agreement in the event that the debtor is in bankruptcy or is insolvent. Chapters uh, 10 and 11 are receivership chapters, and there is a Reader's Digest version of my textbook, my other textbook on, on receiverships, but they give you an excellent guide, I think, um, of, of the basic differences between court and private and the problems that the receiver faces with third parties such as landlords, tax bodies, um, landlords, uh, employees, uh, uh, third-party contractors, suppliers. Uh, chapter 12 is a new chapter in the Bar Ad course. It came in a few years ago, but it deals with liquidations under our Provincial Business Corporations Act, and it covers basically shareholder fights uh, as well as uh, the duties and powers of, of the uh, liquidator uh, when appointed. And remember, liquidation is very different from receivership and bankruptcy. Liquidation presumes that the company, of course, is solvent rather than insolvent, which a receivership can be, and of course, insolvent, which a bankruptcy is. The last three chapters, um, chapters 13, 14, and 15, cover uh, bankruptcy material, looking at it from a third party's point of view, uh, when I went through the bar ad course, it was always from the trustee's point of view. And most of us never acted for trustees. We acted either for the creditor or the debtor. Um, the, this material gives you a perspective from both the creditor side, putting the debtor into bankruptcy, from the debtor side, giving advice to the debtor, also giving advice to the debtor when to make a deal or how to make a proposal to its creditors, as well as what the trustee can do to you if you're a third-party creditor. Uh, how the trustee administers the estate. So I think those three chapters will bring you into focus of the, of the, of the bankruptcy. Um, what I think is a bonus to you in the material and in this today's program is also the precedents. The precedents have been designed to cover a case study in the bar ad, uh, the rise and fall of a small business. And the precedents contain the names and numbers and everything else. So it's a flow through. So anytime you've got a problem with respect to debt collection or moving it into PPSA, you should find, I hope, consistency through names and numbers. And that way, it'll come back to you as to what the function is. Also, the materials in the sense of affidavits and security documentation have been drafted with, with the sections and case law in mind. So there may be a coordination when you look at it. Why is that sentence there? Because perhaps there's a case that, that, that says it should be there. 
and needed in support of your particular motion. Uh, the speakers will be referring to the materials from time to time. Uh, we do not have any formal uh, lecture period, but they're given approximately 40 minutes to cover their material, and if there's questions arising, they'll, they'll either stop midway or the, at the end of the, uh, their period, they'll ask for questions. Please don't be shy. Um, it's your day. It's how-to approach rather than substantive law. The other little book that you've got is something that I'm experimenting with and I have experimented with over the last few years with the bar admission course. And that is a collection, if you will, of review and checklists in this area of law. And I thought of you in mind, I also thought of the bar admission course student in mind, who's very busy and wants to know what do I have to do? What is the black letter law? And sometimes you will, if you have a an academic inclination, sit back and say, why is that? And uh, you may be able to get the answer either from the textbook or from the checklist. Um, the checklists are, I should tell you at the outset, are designed to be not all-inclusive. They're designed to review an area, if you will, so that uh, you perhaps haven't forgotten anything. And uh, it's an area, for example, in, uh, in powers of sale. Uh, there, these are your 30 steps in conducting a power of sale on behalf of a mortgagee. There may be 31, there may be 32. But it does focus your mind on the particular problems. And we've attempted to do that in other areas. Some areas are more adaptable than, than perhaps the power of sale uh, uh, area. Um, if this works out well, then we could perhaps incorporate it into subsequent bar admission course uh, not only in debtor-creditor, but also into other areas. And it's good for you because uh, you've got something to look at quite readily, quite quickly, and um, it gives you an idea of what you should be doing. So you've got two volumes. Uh, one is very practice-oriented, and the other one is more legal and uh, business-oriented. That concludes my opening. I'd like to um, introduce our first um, speaker. Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Bernard Gazzi here today. Bernie's on my immediate left. Bernie uh, graduated from the uh, Bar Ad in 1970 uh, with honors after attending Osgoode Hall School, Law School. Um, he's practiced with his own firm of Winch and Gazzi since 1971, and he's done a great deal of work in the uh, civil litigation area and especially in the collections. He acts for a number of uh, large uh, banks and collection agencies, and. Uh, in attempting to collect from the consumer debtor and the business debtor, and has had a great deal of experience in the collection process. Uh, please welcome Bernie Gazzi. It came to my mind while I was sitting here that what I'm going to say today about collecting a liquidated debt may well apply to collecting an outstanding legal receivable that you might have in your office. So that might uh, attract your attention right from the start. So uh, we're talking today about collecting a liquidated debt. It could be arrears of rent, a bank loan, a amount owing on an invoice for sale of goods, or it could even be a legal account receivable. So that might be close to your heart. And so if you have a $10,000 account that someone hasn't paid, you know the financial burden of that, and you know the uh, aggravation of that, so you might relate to how your client feels if he comes to see you and he has a debt to collect. We call it a liquidated debt if it's something that's uh, readily subject to calculation without a judge assessing it. If it's a broken arm, you can't say, well, the broken arm is worth 3000 or 7000 A judge has to assess it. But a liquidated debt was considered something that is readily calculable, four months rent times a thousand dollars is four thousand dollars or if you have an invoice of a thousand pair of shoes at uh, ten dollars a piece you know how much it is um, and I think the best place to start is if you're acting for a client regarding collection of debts is prevention just like a doctor as soon as you go into him which uh, lecture you about uh, losing weight or watching your blood pressure I feel an obligation if you want to maintain a good relationship with your clients in this area is although they feel good if you collect $10,000 that's owed, they'd even feel better if you sat them down, if you saw they had a problem in this area, and talked to them about how to prevent getting into that situation. So my first topic is prevention. And when you're discussing this with your clients, have them know who they're dealing with. Identify the 
debtor or the pot uh, potential defendant. Uh, it's amazing how many people come in to see lawyers and they say, well, this um, John's, John's uh, company owes me $10,000. But who's John's company? They don't know if it's a limited company. They don't know if it's a partnership. They don't know um, even where it, uh, it's located sometimes. They, John came in and picked up $10,000 worth of goods and left the store, and they, they, that's all they have. So it's important to know who they're dealing with uh, and an uh, exact type of legal identity, if it's a uh, numbered company, um, where it was incorporated, and uh, if it's a partnership, who are the partners, and the exact name. Uh, and it's amazing how often they don't have that. Similarly, it's important that they be trained to have a trail of paper behind them. If they have even a simple contract outlining um, the value of the goods that they're selling so that later there's not a dispute whether the goods were $10 for the pair of shoes or $9 for the pair of shoes. So any contract that they can have or any trail of paper will be much helpful in collecting the debt later or if you have to go to trial. Similarly, um, in today's um, interest-oriented society, it's a very important if they deal with a potential debtor or if they're granting credit to stipulate the interest rate in a contract because uh, since 1978, the courts will allow uh, interest, pre-judgment interest and post-judgment interest at a contractual rate. So if you have a uh, credit card at 24% or a good sold at 18% or anything that's not unconscionable, the courts will usually honor it if there's an agreement in writing. And so if you don't have anything, the courts will still allow you the judicial rate, which I think is about 10% today. But there's a big difference between 10% and 24%. And in negotiating a settlement with a uh, debtor, if you can throw away or have that extra percentage to uh, negotiate with or to uh, put pressure on him with, if he doesn't pay, it's an important factor. If a debtor thinks he's buying time, he wants to buy six months, he may be less anxious to do so if he knows that interest is running at 24% or 18%. Similarly, you may want to stipulate in any contract the terms of the contract, when the payments are due, how they're payable, so there's no misunderstanding. And you may want to encourage your clients to get references from other suppliers or other trade creditors. And of course, you may want to consider security. Uh, you should enlighten your uh, creditor clients on the benefits of security agreements, guarantees, post-dated checks, assignment of receivables, and similar security. And I believe some of the other lectures we'll be talking about them. Some uh, clients are not uh, used to dealing in these areas, they're not sophisticated in these areas, and they'd really be impressed by you and you could help them a great deal if you enlighten them in these areas. And although it seems fundamental, even if, if uh, you should instruct your clients to get to know the internal dealings of the um, person who's gonna be paying them. Who's in charge of paying them? If he's dealing with a large institution, who's in charge of paying them? Who should he call to get paid? What's the name and address of the company who he's dealing with? Okay, so that, that's the basic prevention, and I can't emphasize enough, uh, although your client may come to you to collect one debt, if you can save them from bringing 10 other matters to you, you will be very impressed. Now, the second topic I'm gonna to talk to you about is preparing for collection. And I put in bold letters on my outline there, give matter priority time is of the essence. And that's repeated throughout the checklist because that's the most important thing you can do is give priority to this matter Time is of the essence. You can't let it sit in your desk for weeks until you get to it because um, you're racing against other creditors. If the person who you're trying to collect the debt from is in financial problem, it would be very unusual if you were the only creditor. If so if you're chasing this debtor, there's usually many other people chasing the debtor, and to some extent, unfortunately, it's a race. And uh, you want to be there first to get any assets there are or to try to make some arrangements with him while he's still got something to make arrangements with you for. So you have to give this matter your attention. It wouldn't be fair to your clients if you're just gonna say, I'm gonna sue, put it aside, and you get to it three weeks later, you might start a claim and then put it aside. You can't, to do an effective um, job in this area, just to the casual, you have to be efficient. Now, um, a client comes in and wants you to collect the debt. First of all, you have to find out how much is owed. Sounds silly, but uh, it's, it's not. A, you know, sometimes the clients don't come in in the neat package and say, uh, 
They just say collect this stuff. They're not even sure. They have they have a pile of invoices. Some they're paid, some they're not paid. So you have to find out exactly how much is owed. And you may have to convert it to Canadian funds. It may be in, in a foreign debt, or it may be in marks or U.S. dollars or pounds. So you may want to convert it uh, to Canadian dollars to know what you're dealing with. And you want to know as of what date. He may come in and say collect ten thousand dollars, but it's important to know whether that's ten thousand dollars that's owed from January 1st, 1988 or from January 1st, 1984, because you may want to update it to 1988, or you may want to use the basic figure or the base figure from 1984, but claim prejudgment interest from 84 to 88. So you want to know how old the debt is and exactly how much it is. And the age of the debt is important also, because it's old since 84, and that he may have been sitting on it, uh, nothing done on it since 84, the address may be stale that you have. It's no use saying, I'm going to issue the claim on the address on the invoice because it may not be there for the last four years. So the age of the debt will help affect your tactics and how you're going to approach the matter. Uh, you, so you want to consider that. You may want to also consider limitation period. Generally speaking, in this area, there's a six-year limitation period from the last activity, from the last transaction, whether it be a payment or whether it be a sale of goods. And you might also want to get the background from your client as to whether there's a prospective counterclaim. If he's suing because he sold 10,000 television sets and they were all lemons, you want to know that in advance. So you may want to hire a, or get an opinion from a television expert. Or you may want to anticipate the counterclaim or the defense in preparing your statement of claim a little more special. And as you prepare for to search, you may want to bear in mind as you prepare to sue what you're going to do with the lawsuit because always just to sue is not necessarily effective. Generally speaking, in this area, it's important when you sue to know what you're going to do with your lawsuit. Are you aiming to get a judgment so you can garnish his wages, to seize his car, to close up the business by having the sheriff seize the assets, or to or to seize a boat or to sell some land. You have to have a goal. Just to sue for the sake of suing is not necessarily good enough. There may be a certain percentage out there that if you sue somebody, they're going to pay up just by the threat of the lawsuit or by receiving a statement of claim. But a large percent of the percentage of the debtors, that won't be enough. You're going to have to take it a step further. So you want to know what you're going to do with the judgment. If you're going to spend X hundreds or thousands of dollars going through the court system, getting the judgment, and then saying, what am I going to do with it? You may be doing your client a disservice. So you should try to consider in advance what you're going to do if and when you get a judgment, how you're going to enforce it. And you may want to look at the nature of the debt. For example, if it's, you're suing for $10,000 of, of services, that's one thing. You're, if you're suing for $10,000 for goods sold and delivered, that may give you a clue that maybe if you get a judgment, you can seize back those goods. If you sold it, vote for $10,000 and the man didn't pay for it, if you get a judgment, you might be able to have the sheriff seize the boat back. So looking at the nature of the debt may give you some indication. I remember I had a claim where a man bought about $10,000 of art on credit cards. Um, so after we got a judgment from him, we knew he had the art, so we went in and he seized, he seized the art. He tried to claim that it was his wife's art. He gave it to his wife, but we had the uh, credit card slips where we showed that he had bought them and we were able to use that to show that the art was his as opposed to his wife's. So you've got all the preliminary matters, you've thought about these things, you've maybe done some preliminary searches of executions to see if there's any other executions or there's any uh, PPSA registrations to see if there's any secured security against any of his assets and now it's time to sue. Um, first of all, you have to look at the jurisdictional problems what court you're going to be in. Can you be in Ontario? You have to sue out of Ontario. And should you be in the small claims court, the district court, or the Supreme Court? Uh, I personally, particularly in Toronto, no matter how large the debt is, if it's a strictly, quote, collection debt, wouldn't put it in the Supreme Court because I see no purpose, since time is of the essence, in waiting a year, a year and a half on the trial list, when in the district court you could be on the trial in, in probably a third of that time. So if, uh, the idea is time is of the essence. You're not trying to impress the debtor by saying it's in the Supreme Court as opposed to the District Court. Uh, you want to get there to trial as soon as possible if you're going to have to go that route. So you decide on your court, 
And you also have to um, decide on are your clients instructed to sue. Your client may have told you to come in, I want you to collect the debt, but does he want you to sue? Some clients in this area, uh, although they're, the debtor is not paying them, they still value that debtor as a, they hope to get more business from or future business. So you have to make it sh sure that they want to cross that fine line and not only want you to collect the debt, but they want to sue because if you sue that, quote, customer of your clients, uh, it may end the business relationship forever. Now that, that may be good for them, they may want that, but at the same time, they may not want that because they may feel that this is an important source of their business and if and when they can get paid, they want to get that business. So you want to make sure that they actually want you to sue and to establish the fee arrangements with your client. Um, some clients take the position, if you don't collect anything, you're not going to get paid. They think that this area of uh, work is a special area of work and that they're not going to pay you unless you collect. So you want to make your situation very clear. You also want to see what background work has been done by your client or other agents on their behalf before you sue. Has a demand letter been sent out? Has there been any contact with the debtor? And if there hasn't, you may want to, it's not usually prudent to either call up the debtor or send a demand letter to the debtor because it's important to set up a relationship with the debtor. If you just sue him right away, he may get to a lawyer and the litigation process has started and that usually may have some negative consequences. Whereas you contact him by letter and he responds or you call him up, you may be able to set up a line of communication. He may say, I'm a little short this month, I have a cash flow problem, or I'm ill or unemployed. And you may set up a line of communication and he say, look, I do owe the debt, but I can't pay you for three months. Where if he send it to a, if you sue him right away, he'll put in a frivolous defense, I don't owe the debt, and you have to go through the, the process. But if you communicate with him first, you know he really owes a debt, and he acknowledges to you he owes a debt, and you don't have an ethical problem there because you're not dealing with a lawyer yet, you're just dealing with the debtor and he hasn't got a lawyer, and so you can talk to him and he'll have a hard time later denying he owes a debt if he's admitted to he owes a debt and it's just a financial problem. So if you set up a line of communication and let's say he says I've been ill and, or my wife just passed away and I'm in mourning, but he says I have a $50,000 life insurance policy coming through, then you know you may be able to um, work with them to, let's say, get an assignment of the life insurance or an assignment of the monies coming from a car accident that he's been involved in. So if it's a legitimate financial problem, you may be able to find out information from them through cooperation and through communication and um, collect it that, that way. That's often a very good consideration is the taking of assignment of his receivables. Or maybe if the debtor has receivables, um, you can find out how he's collecting them and um, when he collects those, you can collect from him. So a line of communication also you let you know if you're dealing with a meek person or a tenacious person or um, if you're dealing with a company that has 16 offices or, or is a small business, it lets you learn a little bit about your adversary before you get started. So from a tactical point of view, you know what to do. So I emphasize to try and set up a line of communication with your debtor so that you know um, what to anticipate and what type of uh, know thy enemy, so to speak. Also, you don't want to give an idle threat. If it's that your client's been to another lawyer or some other agent before and they said that we're going to sue you in 10 days and there's been three, three letters like that before, it's a little embarrassing for you to send out the same letter. It's one, very important if you say something, you're going to do something to do it. If you say unless the debt is paid in 10 days, you're going to sue them, then you should do it. Because it's not very impressive if you say unless if you're going to sue in 10 days, don't pay in 10 days, I'm going to sue you and you don't do it for three months. He said, well, I'm, they know already that they're buying time and you're sloppy. So if you make a threat, you're going to sue in 10 days. If you're not paid, follow up in 10 days. It's a very important to have a, a tickler system or a diary system. So you follow up effectively and you press them. Then on the 10th day, if they didn't pay, he knows he's in trouble if you sue him right away. So follow up. And of course, before you commence the lawsuit, you may want to discuss with your client any other um, alternatives, such as enforcing any security that you may have, repossessing a car, a, ch a chattel mortgage, a real estate mortgage, or any other type of security, or consider the possibility of a bankruptcy petition. However, if you're going to proceed with a lawsuit and you've explored all the other alternatives and uh, communicated with the debtor or try to communicate with the debtor and know there's no other alternative, 
Um, you want to proceed with the litigation as soon as possible. And again, time is of the essence. Um, you should prepare a statement of claim uh, using the standard form of statement of claim for a liquidated debt. Be sure and claim interest and be sure and get the correct name of the debtor. There's nothing more frustrating than going through the process and making sure if you have an ABC Inc. and it's ABC uh, Ontario Limited and you have the wrong name and it's hard for the enforce the judgment. Or if you know that if it's an individual debtor and they it's, it's Jane Smith and she's now married and called Jane Jones and it's good to put all the alternative names, Jane Jones, also known as Jane Smith or formerly known as Jane Smith. Uh, trying to put the full names and as many aliases as you possibly know on the claim so you're not frustrated when you get the judgment and you can't enforce it because you got the wrong name. So take a minute and an extra minute and get the correct name uh, of the person you're going to sue and all possible names, bearing in mind that if they own land and you just sue uh, uh, R. Smith, R. Smith, you may not be able to force your execution against R. Smith if they own land, or it may not come up in a serif search. So uh, usually initials are not as effective as the full names Again, you may um, want to, after you issue your claim and send it out for service with your process server, give your process server some special instructions. If this person is a debtor, debtors are sometimes known to evade service or to be a little evasive. Uh, under our current rules, if it's a corporation, you can just serve their head office or a person in charge of their head office. So corporations aren't usually too difficult to serve now. And individuals can be served either personally or by substitutional service or by alternate service by leaving at their home. So under our um, current rules, it's much easier to serve now, but you may want to, if you anticipate a problem, and this is an area, unlike soon an insurance company or a major corporation, where people are trying to delay, trying to be evasive. So you may want to give your um, process service special instructions that the man has a beard, the man has white hair, the lady uh, has a scar across her chin, anything like that to help identify um, the person. After you serve your claim, the person has 20 days to file a defense under our rules. And again, it's important to have a system in your office, if you're going to do this on any type of organized or volume basis, to try and follow up. You can't just leave it to chance that you'll get around to signing judgment when you have a time <laughs> after you've closed that real estate deal or after you've closed finish that trial because it's important that time is of the essence and you want to have a system that as soon as the claim comes back and you notice what day was served to mark ahead the 20 days and then the 20 day or the 21st day to get your judgment. You don't want to do it on the 105th day or the 200th day. You're not helping your client. You're helping the debtor by buying time. Also, the debtor will be impressed by your aggressiveness and your client will also if you're doing it on time. So again, I can't emphasize enough, be organized follow up, you'll be getting results that way. Once the time limit has gone by, you can prepare a standard bill of cost and requisition and you take the papers over to the court office and they provide you with a judgment and at the same time it's usually prudent to issue a writ of seizure or a writ of execution, uh, now called a writ of seizure and sale. Writ of seizure and sale, um, our system is still antiquated in Ontario. We can't file one writ of seizure and sale for the whole province. We still have to do it uh, in different counties. Now, you want to consider where your debtor lives. If your debtor is a corporation and it has, if you're fortunate to have a judgment against McDonald's, for example, they may have um, stores in every county. Or any, if it's a large company, you may want to file um, uh, executions in various counties where the debtor may have a, um, a residence or a property or carry on business. And so consider that you, you can issue as many writs of seizure and sale as you want in as many, um, prop, in many counties as you want. So consider that uh, where the debtor carries on business, where the debtor resides, where the debtor has a cottage, where he has a boat, uh, where he may have an investment. Then after you've got your um, judgment and you've filed your writ of seizure and sale, you sit back 
And you may want to notify the debtor one more time. I'm going to, um, you may not want to warn them what you're going to do because you may not want to help them out, but you may want to contact them, say, send them a copy of the judgment, say, unless this is paid within five days, we're going to take steps to enforce the judgment. Hopefully you'll get a read. Now, if the debtor contacts you, which often they do, because often it's only usually a financial problem that they are, there's various ways, and here's where you can use your imagination to structure something that's fair to your client and fair to them. Um, you can get post-dated checks, you can get a lump sum settlement. If he owes 10,000, they will take nine. Or you can say, we'll take um, post-dated checks for the principal only, or we won't post-judgment interest. If you have a judgment for $10,000, it's gonna collect interest under our current rules um, at the stipulated rate. So that interest is always running on the judgment so you might advise the debtor that, for example, if you pay us so much a month, we won't collect any more interest. But if you go into default, the interest will be collected. So if you give them some incentive to pay you, such as waiving interest or future interest, they have some incentive, you're using a weapon. So uh, it's important to be imaginative and things like that, to give them a carrot or a goal to work at. If you uh, tell them that you need $1,000 a week or $1,000 a month, or you want maybe the maybe um, if they'll give you some security or a mortgage, you'll make some new arrangements with them, or your your imagination should be unlimited, and you should be able to look at each situation and try to approach it depending on your client's individual needs and the debtor's individual needs. For example, your um, creditor who you're acting for may be a large institution, and this may not be that the twenty thousand dollars that you're suing for may not be a large factor. They may just be suing to some extent in principle. And then you have more flexibility. If the twenty thousand dollars that you're suing for is vital to your client, and if you don't get it, it may put your client under or cause your client considerable distress to him and his bank, then you may have not have as much uh, um, freedom as to how you're going to negotiate. So you have to look at the your own particular client and see how vital or how urgent the particular debt is to your client as well as the situation of the debtor. Again, can't repeat often enough, time is of the essence. After you get your judgment, you just can't put it away and say the job is done because your client hired you, in most cases, not to get the judgment, to get money. And the client wouldn't be that impressed if you sent out your account and said, we've done the job, here's the judgment, thank you very much. Because they hired you, in most cases, to get money not to get them a piece of paper. However, it might be impressive to send your client to judge them just to let them know that you've done something. You may want to send your client to state in the claim to know you've done something. But just as in any area of practice, it's important in this area to show them that you're doing things. You may want to let them know as you're going along, here's a copy of the claim, here's a copy of the proof of service, here's a copy of the judgment. Let them know you're doing things to keep on, you're keeping on top of things. After you've got your judgment, if you can't work something out with the debtor, then you have to consider various alternatives. Of course, one of the best ones is if, the, um, if, if they own land, then you know under our current rules that after four months you can start proceedings to sell the land, and after six months you can actually sell it. And if you have that remedy and it's economical, you should do it. Because if you wait three, four, five months, there'll probably be other execution creditors there and you have to share with them. Under the Executions Act and Credit Relief Act, you have to share pro rata with any other uh, creditor. So it's not first in, first out. You don't get your money first if you're the first execution. You have to share. So time is not on your side. Um, so you may want to check to see if there's any other executions. If there's not many, or if yours is the biggest, or if it's economical to do, you want to sell the land. and. Again, if you write a letter to the debtor saying, get ready, you're moving, um, usually you get a response pretty fast. Um, you know, I'll call them up and say, what moving, what moving company are you using? Or, um, you know, I hear your house is up for sale, I like to buy it, I hear the sheriff's, you know, um, that usually gets a pretty good response because a, a man's home is still his castle and uh, he wants to think of his wife and his children or the wife wants to think of her husband and the children. So if you let somebody know that you're attacking their castle, you're going after their property, they'll usually do anything reasonably to try and rectify your situation. So that should be your first consideration, seeing what real estate there is. Or if it's a business, you want to have the sheriff 
check to see if there's any security, if there's a, if the inventory is secured, or uh, what uh, security is against the business. After you analyze that, send the sheriff in to see anything that isn't tied up. If uh, if the restaurant have the sheriff see, stay by the cash register and take the cash, uh, every time that the sheriff tell the sheriff to stay there for a couple hours. And every time the customer pays, the sheriff picks the cashier. Very very soon that restauranteur is gonna call you up and say, let's work something out here. If you have the sheriff sit in a man's business, uh, the man's not gonna carry on business very well, very long. Or if you had the sheriff go in, I remember I had a judgment against a large corporation who were just stubborn. They didn't wanna pay. They could afford to pay it a hundred times. They didn't wanna pay. So I tell the, as a large corporation and um, old fashioned, they thought they didn't have to pay judgment. So I told the sheriff to go in and take their boardroom table. <laughs> And I had a certified check in a half an hour. <laughs> so um, even the, the big may fall. Um, so if the business sees assets, tell the sheriff to go in and he can do what's called a levy. He'll go in and interview them. He'll assess the situation. He'll, he'll see if there's any desks that you can seize, any inventory that you can seize. He'll go out and have a little friendly chat with the uh, manager of the business and maybe see if the, uh, their uh, machinery will fit through the door so we can carry it out. And as soon as he starts measuring the things up, the, the people will get the message. Or if he backs up with a truck, they will get the message. And if you have to go through with it, you go through with it. Uh, and the sheriff will sell it. Um, so you can sell assets. You can sell um, property. You can sell boats. You can sell vehicles. Uh, we just had an interesting situation in the office where um, we seized a man's vehicle on a Friday, and then on that Saturday, the man went to the um, motor vehicle registration and registered it in his wife's name, and he tried to take the position that he sold it to her a couple of days before we seized it, but he only transferred it uh, the day after we seized it. And we went through the litigation, and finally, we, he wasn't able to convince the judge that it was an arm's length bona fide transfer, and that uh, we were able to get his car. So these things can be done, and you shouldn't uh, be anxious to do it. That's your obligation to do it. Um, in addition to seizing things, there's a garnishee, and unlike maybe if any of you haven't done anything recently, our new garnishee system is very effective. Under the old system, if you wanted to garnishee something, you had to do like a dripping tap. Every week or every two weeks, you had to send out a garnishee at each pay period for each payment. Now, if you send out a garnishee under our district court system, it's effective for six years. That's an awesome weapon. Uh, it, 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 for six years, the rec recipient of that garnishee has to honor that garnishee. So if you send it to an employer, he knows he's stuck with deducting these payments for six years. If you send it to um, a bank, They've got to watch his account for six years. So these people are going to help. They're going to help you to go to this debtor and say, look, why don't you straighten this out? We don't want this paperwork. Technically, they're not allowed to fire the employee because of it, but they're certainly not going to be help, happy with the employee. So uh, if you send out a garnishee, it's a very acceptive, you got him trapped. Um, those are some of the methods that you can use. Also, you can use a judgment debtor examination. Um, call, invite the man down to come and be examined under oath to be examined and you can ask him a very it's a cross-examination you can uh, drive him crazy uh, and if it's a person that you think is a, uh, it's a if it's a legitimate debtor you'll find out when you meet him face to face he may be sick he may be unemployed he may have good reason not to pay you and there are often good reasons. There may be a legitimate person who just can't afford it. He may be honest and rightful. You may want to tell your client, this man just can't pay. He never will pay. Forget it. You're not going to collect it. Why throw good money after bad? The man is honest. And he just can't pay. He's, he's dying of cancer. He's, uh, he's had this. He's had that happen. You're not going to pay. Or the company has gone into business and he's left a trail of debts behind. And there's no use paying. It's locked up at stores. So you know the situation. You close up your file and goodbye. If you have a professional debtor that's playing games with you, you may want to drive him crazy. You want to see his income tax returns, his invoices, his ledgers, his book. Send him on a paper chase, and he may want to. And if he, obviously he's not going to have everything there, and you have him back a week later with more paper. 
and he still won't have enough, and bring him back a week later for more paper. And if you bring him back week after week, getting paper and paper, as long as it's legitimate, he'll maybe think that he's got to resolve the matter with you. So it's good to have him on a paper chase or to ask him lots of deep, detailed questions that he's got, got a lot of undertakings for and follow up on those undertakings. And if he, he, if he realizes it's not a game, but a serious problem he has, you may be able to get effect collection. Also, by meeting the person face to face, you get to size them up. You may want to find how he came to the examination. Did he come by car? Ask for the keys? Have the sheriff pick it up? Um, how does he tend to go home by car? Not so fast. <laughs> um, just going back to amusing story, um, the case I mentioned before with the, um, the husband who transferred the car to his wife, he tried to bring a motion when we seized the car be, um, to set aside the seizure, et cetera, et cetera. And the motion was at 10 o'clock, and he came at 11 o'clock before Master Sandler. And uh, he started to apologize why he's waiting. He says, Master Sandler says, don't worry, I know you didn't have a car, you had to take public transportation. So it was... Um, sort of amusing that he had to come late, he had to come all the way uh, quite a distance uh, by public transportation because he didn't have his car. Um, but he also got the message um, that we meant business. So that uh, basically are some of the remedies. If you're able um, to collect, your job is not finished there. You owe an obligation to um, clear up the execution. Many, many situations, people collect the debt and they walk away. And five years later, there'll be a panic call that this man's is buying a property or selling a property, and he's got an execution. You forgot to lift the execution. That could be embarrassing to yourself. It could be embarrassing to your client. It's important after you collect to lift the execution. I know there was a case several years ago where um, some law firms left a couple of executions on after they collected a debt, and somebody else, meanwhile, got a judgment against the same debtor. And the sheriff, when he goes into seize, seizes not only uh, the one debt for the creditors asking, but he seizes on behalf of all execution creditors. So if, he, if Eaton's asked the sheriff to seize, to enforce a particular judgment, the sheriff will look in his files, and if there's 10 other executions, he'll seize for all those 10 executions. In a couple, situation a couple years ago, some, the sheriff went in to seize something from an antique dealer, and the one particular creditor only, only was owed about 20000 but the sheriff had about $100,000 of uh, executions listed. So he seized $100,000 worth of antiques and cleaned out the antique shop, sold it all, and then it turned out that it was only about $10,000 owed because all the other executions had really been paid off, but they hadn't been lifted. And there was some liability there to the lawyers who left on the executions. So that's something to bear in mind. So I think you have to lift executions. You have to terminate a garnishee even though the man has paid you, you can't just walk away because the employer is stuck with this notice that says he has to make deductions for six years or the bank has to wash the account for six years. So again, you must terminate the garnishee or you may cause yourself or your client some embarrassment. You want to make clear up the credit rating with some cre any, report, any credit agencies you reported it to. You, you should provide the man with a final release and a satisfaction piece or a dismissal or, or discontinuance of the action and report to your client. Similarly, uh, if you're collecting checks over a long period of time or payments over a long period of time, you may want to report to your client periodically and send him the money periodically so he knows you haven't left the country with it or you haven't fallen asleep. So again, reporting to your client if these matters go, often go on for many months or many years is very important. And finally, the alternative thing is it reaches a point where no return where you may want to discuss with your client, this is simply uneconomical or uncollectible. Uh, let's close it out. Don't throw good money after bad. Um, we don't have a perfect system. You're not going to collect them all. And if you collect a reasonable percentage uh, and you've exhausted your re remedies reasonable, you've done your job. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Be petitioned or you file an assignment within, say, three months or even in some cases a year? 
Well, there's that risk. Right? There's that risk, but it's better than nothing. It's it, it, it's um, it, it's something. Um, is it better to take that risk than to get nothing at all? Um, also, there may be consideration for that. In other words, if uh, um, if for example, um, you're about to uh, sell his car, and um, you um, forego that, um, or you're taking the mortgage or something like that, it may not necessarily be considered a preference if he was under, um, if there was true valuable consideration for that. So you may be able to structure it so that it's a, a proper, um, it'll, it'll avoid a preference situation. But it's a, it's a valid point. There's certain risks in anything. If you give the man time to pay, for example, rather than insisting on it right away, you're taking a risk because he may be bankrupt in three months. Uh, or if you take posted checks or any situation. So in any, like in any litigation, there's always a risk. There's always a gamble. We all have the benefit of hindsight. We wouldn't um, be here. But there is um, there are always a possibility is that you may uh, be considered to be taking a preference in certain situations. Yes. Um, in a situation where you have information uh, and you uh, really plan to keep him set up that he's going to bankrupt, um, and you serve a notice of garnishment on, on the bank, and maybe you didn't think that the bank was going to recount, but they're all lying to credit and they're all negative balances. Um, but the corporation still deposits money on a weekly basis and makes employees uh, draw the checks and run the accounts. Um, could the argument exist that? Yeah, I understand. Well, you get, I think, uh, let's say, for example, the company has a, uh, a nil bank account, it has a bank account, but nothing in it, and they're overdrawn by $5,000. And they put in a check, they, get it, they come with a check to deposit it for $2,000. Does that create a positive $2,000, or does this reduce the overdraw to $3,000? Um, or, and let's say, they still, there's an ongoing debt to the bank, so if, if there's a garnishee come in, does the, um, the bank get their money first? Uh, I think there's a, there's a few cases on it, and which is not unusual. I think they go both ways, um, as I recall. More importantly, though, is that, yeah, that argument exists, and I can see the bank's argument that it would reduce their, their overdraft. Um, but in a situation where you have money that's specifically uh, deposited into the, the bank account to cover employee checks that have been written out, um, is well, the argument to go again that it just reduces the overdraft, and then once the employee has cashed the checks, it's wrapped? Well, I think that. What the intent of the money is that they put in the account, I don't think is, is relevant in law. In other words, they may put it in to pay the employees, but once it goes into the account, it's money like anything else. For example, let's take the reverse, and then I'll come back to that. Let's say um, you can only garnish she 20% of a man's wages. But let's say for some reason you don't garnish she it, and he gets his paycheck and puts it in his bank account. Then you seize the whole bank account. You can get 100%, even though it's his wages, once he takes the, his wages and puts it in the bank account, it ceases to be a wage, it ceases, becomes cash. So this is this, this reverse situation. If a company um, puts money in their bank to pay their employees, what, the, what it's there for is irrelevant. It's just money. If it, it, um, the employees aren't entitled to any particular preference or priority to any other creditor. Uh, they're just a creditor like anybody else. And, and to some extent, if you have a judgment, you stand higher because you're a judgment creditor. You you have a your debt confirmed and uh, by by judgment, you're in a higher position there, employees. So that uh, I think they would, you if you happen, for example, forget about the situation. Let's say they put five thousand dollars into their bank account, and you happen to be there and you snatched it. That's your money, in my opinion. That, that wasn't my question. Yeah, but. That, that, Right. Um, does the bank treat that the moment that money is deposited as reducing their overdraft, overdraft by five thousand? And then it, as each employee cashes their check, the overdraft goes back up to ten thousand. I see or that. Are you? If the argument, if the argument exists, you are entitled to that money because it's not really what it amounts to is a debt owing to the corporation. I understand. Well, I think if it just reduced the overdraft, it was still an overdraft. 
they would could well say there's no balance feasible in that account. So I, I think that uh, really what it is doing is the bank is just really extending the line of credit as each employee cashes his check. Um, so I think that you would probably not be successful in, in a seizure in that particular case. Well, there's the other side of that story, too, and I, I think there's a couple of cases under the garnish C section that discusses, and I think they go both ways. Is for let, forget, leave out the employees, because that just uh, puts a red herring in. Let's say um, there's an overdraft of $10,000, and they get a check in that they're going to put in their account for 5000 and you have a, a, a garnish against that account. Does the bank have a higher right of priority to you. In other words, it, once it goes into the account, is it automatically, um, is it not subject to the garnishee or can the bank, does the bank have a priority to it? And I, 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 again, I think there are unfortunately cases going both ways. The bank has a right of set off, as Frank says, but I, I believe there's a couple of cases under the uh, garnishee section that discuss it and they say that it, that doesn't necessarily have a right of set off because um, uh, it could be argued that as soon as it goes into the bank, it belongs to the bank. But I think that the relationship between a banker and his client is just one of debtor creditor. So the, the bank, um, although they could claim that they have a right of set up to that money, they, it, it could be argued the other way that they're just a creditor. And I think that that's uh, an area that is still open for um, counsel to use their imagination and novelty. And I don't think it's settled as far as I know. Yes. In most cases, there's a right of offset. Is there anything that happens in that case? Well, if somebody else challenges that right of offset, it, uh, you know, if somebody may suggest that uh, the question was, is there all cases a right of offset? Um, the question you may have to prove is that it's bona fide and um, arm's length. Um, for example, um, otherwise, um, somebody may, a third party may question it, and you may be involved in litigation. So. Generally speaking, debts, if there's some mutuality between them or if they're both liquidated, um, there's a right of offset. It doesn't have to be spelled out, but it's, it's preferable if it's spelled out. It doesn't have to be spelled out in the contract, but it, to avoid any suggestion of sham or a fraud, um, in the usual event that that happened, it would, it, it would be better to have some documentation, but it doesn't have to be spelled out. I think you better wait for the uh, bankruptcy discussions on that one. Uh, or, or Frank may want to deal with that one. There's, there's a provision. There's a provision in the uh, Bankruptcy Act, uh, Section 75, I think subsection 3, which permits the uh, creditor to set off against the trustee in bankruptcy of debts preceding the date of bankruptcy. And the right of set off is um, applicable as against the trustee. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much, uh, Bernie. Uh, I find that this area is a very difficult area in collection because uh, you often end up with a judgment after several years of a trial and perhaps a, an appeal to the Court of Appeal and only to find that when you conduct your judgment debtor examination that the cupboard is bare and that the debtor has on the threat of litigation transferred his or her or its uh, property away and uh, you've got a second lawsuit to uncover the problem, fraudulent conveyance or an assignment of preference. And that takes you another five years down the road, at which time the creditor is thoroughly upset and the debtor, of course, is, um, has been able to man maneuver the uh, creditor and the solicitors. So often you get uh, precipitous appointments under uh, receivership or under uh, bankruptcy to avoid that. So normal collection, whether it be collection of our own accounts uh, as lawyers or collection on behalf of clients, 
you'll often see, especially in the last several years, uh, very difficult to collect and bankruptcy uh, comes from it. There is a very detailed checklist for uh, examining a judgment debtor, whether personal judgment debtor or as an officer of a corporation in the materials. And um, that really comes out of a uh, reverse scenario is knowing your customer or your client's customer before you extend the credit. And you see these fancy applications, whether it's Eats and Eaton's or Simpson's or Visa or American Express, that attempt to get all that information out. And it's really a statement of affairs in a bankruptcy. It's all the assets on one side and all the liabilities on the other side. And a statement by the consumer or the officer of the company saying, yes, all the above is correct. And uh, I understand that money is being advanced on the basis of the above. Well, that's also to cut around the Bankruptcy Act in the event that the debtor does go bankrupt. You can probably charge him with civil fraud and sue afterwards. So the judgment debtor list and the statement of affairs concept are raise ways and means of, of attempting to identify assets before you start your lawsuit, before you start your lawsuit, because there's no sense in suing and not having a judgment uh, uh, satisfied. Um, there's a message for... Mr. Dave Nickel. Um, if Dave Nickel is here, would you please come forward and have a message from someone? Our next um, speaker is um, Steve Posen. Steve is a um, graduate of the um, University of uh, Toronto and admitted to the bar in 1965. He's a partner in the firm of Minden and Gross here in Toronto. He's a, a writer. He's contributed a couple of articles to the Shopping Centre textbook published by Canada Law. And he's a member, of course, of a number of organizations. Uh, Steve has a good background in landlord and tenant, and he's going to come and talk to you about uh, distress and relief from forfeiture. Steve? First thing I'd like to do is to make a couple of comments about the uh, the previous the previous lecturer, uh, just by way of describing my own career in the in the creditor creditor debtor area. Uh, the first thing uh, the first thing I'd like to know is that the overriding theme was uh, that time is of the essence. I don't know how many times Mr. Gazzy made that point, and I was supposed to start at ten to ten. It's ten after ten. That's the first thing. <laughs> The second thing I'd like to say is that when I was articling, I learned a couple of key overriding principles uh, of law from my articling principles. One is that for a gun, if there is no schloss, that loosely translates from the Yiddish, uh, that for a thief, there is no really effective lock. And I think that that probably is part of what we heard from Mr. Gazzi, and I think that, uh, that there's a lot of folk wisdom that I learned at that time. Uh, the second thing is that I learned that uh, when I tried to, when in the eagerness of my articling career, when I tried very earnestly to force everything to a quick conclusion, my principal, very relaxed about it, says, just relax, take it easy. Time looks after a lot of these things. And in fact, time did look after a lot of these things, uh, which is, again, a contrary to time being of the essence. But my most favorite experience as a creditor's lawyer was my first judgment debtor examination, which I was set up on. Uh, and, and I went to this judgment debtor examination, and, uh, and uh, when we got to the end and I realized there were no assets, and I asked rather ruthlessly, I felt how much money he had in his pocket, was told none, and I asked, well, then how are you going to get home? Because I'd already gone by the part where he had no car. He said he didn't know how he was going to get home. And when I got back to the office, uh, I had to answer the question, how much money did I lend this fellow? Because they were betting on how much I did lend him. And the answer was five dollars. So, <laughs> so I decided that that was not a good career for me. Uh, the, uh, the bar admission course materials, uh, which is in the fat book that appears uh, that you've received today, are really excellent. And what I will try to do is, uh, and I'll, all I do is commend them to you. By, and by the way, I have sat out there, as, as many of us or all of us have from one time or other, and I know what we do is we go, we pick up the materials on the day of the session, 
and we, you know, we try to keep our eyes propped up through the whole balance of the day while we, while we listen through saying, well, I know it's all in the materials and I'll go home and read them later. And I also know that they sit up on shelves gathering dust. May I tell you that these materials are really comprehensive, comprehensible, they're easy to read and they really cover a lot of, if not all of the material that you'll hear today and, and I really commend them to you. Uh, I will try to survey some of the general principles and give you what I call uh, the Posen solution to the problems in both of the areas that, uh, that, that I'm going to deal with today. Uh, but from my point of view, as I told Frank earlier, I, I really don't like lecturing very much. I much prefer the byplay of either panel discussions or, since there is no panel here, I invite you folks to play the part of the panel and throughout, don't wait till the end, please, if you have any questions about what I'm saying, when I say it, please put up your hand and I'll ask Frank to give you the answer. Uh, the, <laughs> The other thing I have to declare for you is, is that I have a bias, uh, and my bias is, my real bias is, is that there is no such thing as a good tenant, uh, the, the, as my other bias is that I've never had a drink that I didn't like, but, uh, but the real truth is, since we also do act, act for tenants, I guess I have to say there's no such thing as a good defaulting tenant, uh, and, and I find that uh, there are, from a landlord's point of view, a minefield of problems uh, in, in terms of trying to realize upon uh, the, trying to realize upon the various landlord remedies and uh, and I think they require some careful consideration in advance and I think that that's a very important lesson that that came out of the last discussion both from uh, Messrs. Gazzi and Bennett and that is that preparation is really an important factor and the application uh, uh, method that Frank referred to. Uh, is very important from a landlord's point of view in to, to consider prior to leasing property to a tenant because if he's going to run into trouble, he might just as well have had all of the best information he can get in advance to know where he's headed. I'm going to deal firstly with the concept of relief from forfeiture, notwithstanding the order of the checklists. Uh, the, uh, the, the right of a landlord to terminate a lease is covered uh, both by the lease and by the Landlord and Tenant Act. Uh, you can a landlord can terminate a lease for non-payment of rent uh, under the Landlord and Tenant Act, and you'll forgive me, I always forget these days, but I think it takes, unless there's something else provided for in the lease, if the rent is in arrears for 15 days or more, the landlord can terminate the lease. Uh, the, 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 land the Landlord and Tenant Act permits the lease to provide otherwise, and so landlords often don't want to wait 15 days, so they'll provide that they can terminate at any time or after five days in arrears and so on, but the long and short is some period of time after a rent falls into arrears, the landlord can terminate. Uh, the landlord's right to terminate for breach of a covenant other than payment of rent is covered by Section 19.2 of the Landlord and Tenant Act, and you have to be very, very careful if you're really going to try and pursue a termination based on a breach of a covenant other than payment of rent, because that section tells you exactly what your notice has to say, and you have to follow it precisely, even though part of it is, is absurd, because it calls upon you to talk about, to give the tenant a reasonable time for remedying a default, and requires a tenant to make reasonable compensation in money to the satisfaction of the landlord for the breach. And I, I think it's absurd because there are some things for which there is no real basis upon which to provide for compensation in money, but you have to do it. So you have, so you have to do it with care. Um, now. The landlord may terminate a lease in any one of three ways. One is by physically re-entering the premises. One is by bringing an action uh, for termination uh, and possession. And one is by bringing an application under Part 3 of the Landlord and Tenant Act. Uh, the Posen solution to all of these things, almost all, all of such things, is stay away from the courts. Courts confound problems. They, uh, they lean to help defaulting tenants. Uh, wherever an, op an opportunity exists. And th so therefore, the first posing principle is self-help. Uh, now, pursuant to Section 20 of the Landlord and Tenant Act, the first problem, th there's one way a landlord cannot avoid getting into court. I, I, sorry, backing up. Therefore, physically re-enter the premises. And by the way, I guess I should say, I'm sorry for backing myself up. This is why I don't like lecturing. Uh, but the physically re-entering the premises does not mean serving a notice of termination and then walking away and leaving the tenant in possession. You can't say the lease is hereby terminated and leave. At that point in time, the lease has not been forfeited. You must physically re-enter. One way a landlord can't avoid being in court on this question is if a tenant brings an application for relief from forfeiture, which he is entitled to do under Section 20 of the Landlord and Tenant Act. 
Now, the tenant may bring that application even if the landlord either is in the course of or has physically re-entered. He may bring his own application, the tenant may. Uh, if the landlord has commenced either an application under Part 3 or an action, in that action, the tenant may seek relief from forfeiture. Now, as I said, the relief from forfeiture is, is, uh, is granted, as I said, the courts look to lean to help out tenants. The relief from forfeiture will be granted, will be, is available for a tenant to be granted in respect of all breaches of the lease, uh, except those which are covered subsequently in Section 20 of the Landlord and Tenant Act, particularly Section 20 sub 7, the most predominant of which is that if a tenant has assigned the lease without consent, the landlord uh, may not, the, the tenant may not apply for relief from forfeiture. Relief is not available in the case of such a, a default. I suppose the idea is, is that the default has been completed, there's nothing the tenant can do about it, it's happened, and therefore there's nothing based upon which the, the court would have the, uh, the right to be able to, uh, to grant relief because there is a third party in possession. Now, there are ways around that from a tenant's point of view and an assignee's point of view, such as, for example, by assigning subject to the condition that the consent be obtained later and so on, in which case, uh, once, again, uh, the, once again, relief will be granted. However, to show you how far the court goes in order to grant relief from forfeiture, uh, th there was a case which many of you, or most of you may already know about, uh, the Here, Ontario and Menoncella case. It's, uh, if, if it's a 1983 Court of Appeal case, and it held that uh, where there was an assignment for mortgage purposes, uh, the mortgagee having not gone into possession, the tenant subsequently defaulting under the lease and the payment and obligations to pay rent, the landlord sought to terminate. And the court held, notwithstanding the fact that the tenant had assigned the lease for mortgage purposes to the mortgagee assignee, uh, the mortgagee assignee was permitted to apply for uh, and to obtain relief from forfeiture uh, on terms that it pay the arrears of rent and that it then subsequently apply for the landlord's consent to the assignment for mortgage purposes. Now, that really, to me, is really reaching a long way and it tells you, I think, what the courts will do, which is why the best thing to do is to try to stay away uh, from the courts. The uh, granting of relief from forfeiture is an equitable remedy and, uh, and accordingly the applicant tenant would need to have, have uh, behaved properly uh, and, to have, uh, and to have conducted himself, have behaved properly in the circumstances, acted quickly and not otherwise have committed a whole bunch of bad acts. Now, uh, if the tenant has a long history of defaults in a lot of different ways under a lease, uh, the, the court will, notwithstanding the fact that the uh, tenant could remedy the default and obtain relief from forfeiture, the court may, uh, under really pressing circumstances, grant, uh, grant, not grant the relief from forfeiture. But, uh, but just quoting, and this is in the material that you have, if the landlord can be put back into a, a safe position, uh, in a secure position, the court will almost always look to an opportunity to grant the relief from forfeiture. Uh, I have some fun in pointing out that, uh, the, that there is one case that, uh, that is referred to in the materials that where, the, where the court did refuse to grant relief from forfeiture because the tenant had, had breached many, many covenants besides the covenant to pay rent and had a long history. and. Uh, and that case is uh, the Jeans West Unisex and Hung case, a 1975 case reported that you'll see in the materials. But the fun about that case, I think, is, is that Frank Bennett acted for the tenant uh, and Joe O'Brien acted for the landlord. And in that case, the landlord succeeded in resisting the tenant's application for relief from forfeiture, which goes to prove that if you're headed to become a Supreme Court judge, you do have certain advantages. That's the kind of a case where it's desirable to be in court. Um, as a matter of fact, I didn't read the material. This is one that was turned up by Jill Knudsen of my office, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but I did read that afterwards. Uh, for a tenant to maximize its chances of obtaining relief from forfeiture, he really doesn't have to do very much, but, but obviously he has to act quickly, has to conduct himself in such a way as to remedy the breaches effectively, and he may want to give some thought to looking at whether the forfeiture itself was proper because forfeiture, as for example alluded to under 19.2 of the Act, may, may sometimes not be a good forfeiture. Now, 
I have said, I, I, a tenant who has assigned a lease, uh, I'm sorry, there's one more point I have to make. That is that relief from forfeiture may be applied for even though the termination has already occurred, as long as the tenant acts quickly. And there was one case uh, where, where several weeks had gone by, the landlord still was in possession of the premises, had not released it, and the tenant then applied for relief from forfeiture and succeeded in obtaining it. Um, a tenant who assigns the lease and uh, remains, as, we, as tenants always do under the law, liable for all the tenant's covenants to pay rent under the lease, uh, still does not have status to apply for relief from forfeiture, and that's a, that to me is a sort of a substantial problem. If a tenant is going to be selling his business or assigning his lease for some other reason, he turns he, he can do so turning over the premises in one of two methods: either by subletting the premises or by assigning the lease. If he assigns the lease and the person whom he sells the business goes into default and the landlord terminates, uh, or otherwise the tenant falls into arrears. The first tenant, the original tenant, having assigned the lease, has an obligation under the lease to the landlord to pay all of the rent, but does not have the opportunity to take back the premises uh, or to apply to the landlord for relief from forfeiture because he no longer is the tenant with the status to apply for relief from forfeiture. Therefore, if there is any concern in a uh, tenant assigning its lease that is concerned about the party to whom it is doing the assignment, then obviously the tenant has to be very careful about how to handle it. First off, he could sublease the premises in order to retain control, assuming the premises have, have continuing value to the original tenant. Uh, secondarily, what he could do is he could assign the lease to the, to the new tenant, to the assignee, uh, and obtain a conditional assignment back to itself in the event of a default, to which, by the way, also the landlord's consent must be obtained. That is the assignment back. The landlord's, uh, the, landlord's maxima, the landlord's best way in which, to, uh, in which to protect itself against the tenant's right to relief from forfeiture or to apply for it uh, would, is a little bit problematic because uh, the courts, as I've said, they will look to help out a tenant in any way that it can. And in the days since Kelly Douglas, that's rather historical, the tenant's right to property and so on. So in the days since Kelly Douglas, uh, and, a, and, and a lease being viewed more and more as a contract, uh, I'm not sure that the courts should be leaning as, as well as they do, or as much as they do, to help out defaulting tenants. A breach of a contract is a breach of a contract, and a party whose contract is breached, it seems to me, uh, unless it's a completely trivial breach, should have the right to terminate the contract and be rid of the tenant. However, in order to conduct yourself in such a way as to best resist this tenant's right to reply for relief from forfeiture, uh, even keeping track of all of the defaults of the tenant, which assumingly would be a fairly substantial history of defaults by the time you want to really, be, you really want to terminate. Uh, keep track of all of the defaults and all of your remedial actions taken, and, uh, and those things can be lost in history unless you really do keep some kind of a file on it. The, uh, su such as notices of default which have been done, lawyers' letters or lawyers' notices of default which have been done, distresses which have been levied, uh, previous attempts to terminate, previous actions between the parties, and so on, because all of that material in the landlord's affidavit resisting the application for relief from forfeiture really is helpful. However, my experience is that even with a lengthy list of that type, unless the landlord has already been involved in termination proceedings with the tenant, that is terminated, and perhaps the tenant having already succeeded on an occasion or two from in, in obtaining relief from forfeiture, the landlord really is going to be in a disadvantageous position. Therefore, joining this time with Mr. Gazzi, time is not on your side, and I think the proper thing to do is to effect termination of the lease. If you have any worry that this is going to be an ongoing problem, actually terminate the lease and require the tenant either to make application for relief from forfeiture or uh, enter into an agreement that the reinstatement of the lease on the remedying of the arrears or, or other default is as though there had been a successful application for relief from forfeiture because then and then only, I think, the, uh, the, la the courts will, uh, will come to the landlord's assistance. If there had been previous terminations for which the tenant had been relieved, the court will be a little less lenient in terms of granting the relief from forfeiture. It's completely discretionary, and I think you can judge probably as well as, as anybody what the court is likely to do once you know that the court's going to look to help the tenant. Okay, so in the exciting world of relief from forfeiture, are there any who wish to ask any questions? Okay. Uh, the landlord's right of distress is, in my view, 
if I may be forgiven, a rather distressing remedy because uh, I, it really rarely uh, brings anything by way of an effective uh, result from the landlord's point of view. Um, it certainly, I, I'm, I actually don't have experience with it having brought substantial success. It's only a tenant who, uh, well, let me, let me trace through what distress is and I'll come to the end. What distress is, is the right of a landlord to seize the goods of a tenant and hold them and subsequently if the arrears are, uh, and seize the goods of the tenant and hold them and effect a security for arrears of rent, and it's rent that it's good for, and if the rent's not paid to sell the goods and apply the proceeds for the arrears. Uh, it's available only under commercial tenancies, as you all know, under Part 4 of the Landlord and Tenant Act, it's no longer available uh, for residential tenancies. Le a lease, the questions are, the, the features are the effect of the e existence of a landlord-tenant relationship and there being rent in arrears. The lease may provide, and should, in my view, that the landlord may also distrain for arrears of all other amounts payable under the lease. And the way in which to do that is for the lease itself to define rent as being everything which is payable under the lease, whether to the landlord or to third parties such as taxes or other or utilities, uh, which would, if not paid, become a charge on the landlord's property. Uh, so that you can define all those payments as additional rent and also you may and should, I think, provide that the landlord by contract has the right to restrain for arrears of all other amounts under the lease as though they were arrears. By contrast with the right of termination, distress does have the refreshing, pleasurable uh, 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 fa feature to it that you don't have to wait any period of time following the occurrence of the arrears of rent in order to effect distress. You can do it immediately on the day, uh, immediately when the rent is in arrears and so, you, so that, for example, instead of waiting 15 days to terminate, you can distrain uh, on the day following the day the, the lease was, the rent was payable. There must exist a, uh, an ex a relationship between landlord and tenant. I will deal with this more in a moment or two, but the whole concept of distress is, is an incident of a landlord-tenant relationship uh, it, the, and if the lease is terminated, there is no more landlord and tenant relationship. Therefore, termination and the right of distress are mutually exclusive remedies. Although there has to exist a landlord-tenant relationship, I, I am rather, I just am going to refer you to section 41 of the Landlord and Tenant Act because it provides that you can distrain for arrears under a lease within six months following the expiry of that lease, provided that the tenant is still on the premises. Uh, I guess that means if there is an overholding tenancy uh, that the landlord can distrain un for arrears under the previous tenancy, but it rather is an overlooked section, section 41. The, uh, the, and I think you probably all know all of this, so I don't really want to trace it with any great care, but you can't seize the goods of any other person who's on the premises subject to section, I forget, so section 31.2 of the Landlord and Tenant Act. Uh, but if there are, for example, consignment goods on the premises or leased goods on the premises uh, or goods uh, on the premises that the tenant is repairing as part of his repair business, uh, those goods uh, are not, are not su subject to being distrained. If there has been a, if there, because of the requirement that there be a landlord-tenant relationship and because of the requirement that there be arrears of rent, if there is a surrender of the premises which has been uh, which has been accepted, there is distress which is lost. In the case of bankruptcy, uh, distress is lost as well. And although I'll come to the problems that arise from this in just a moment, uh, if, if the landlord distrains and a bankruptcy occurs prior to the landlord having waited the compulsory five days and having sold the goods and applied the proceeds for the arrears of rent, then the distress is not effective, the goods must then be turned back to the landlord so that in the normal case you have a situation, I guess, where a bailiff will attend on the premises on behalf of the landlord, will seize the goods of the tenant in some fashion. Uh, the tenant, for various reasons, may, may assign itself into bankruptcy. Other creditors may, for other reasons, petition the tenant into bankruptcy. The, uh, the date of the bankruptcy will be re retroactive to the date of the petition or will be the date of the assignment. And if that all, and if the if the bailiff is still holding the goods, it has to turn it over to the uh, to the trustee in bankruptcy. 
If the bailiff has sold the goods and still has the proceeds from the sale in its account, my understanding is, and, and more bankruptcy-oriented lawyers have to deal with this, but I believe that the proceeds of that sale still are not the landlord's. It's only once the landlord has received the money and applied the proceeds on the arrears of rent that the distress is completed, and until that time, either the goods or the money received for them are the property of the trustee in bankruptcy. <clears throat> if the landlord has assigned the lease, uh, the landlord, no longer being a landlord, has lost its right of distress. The assignee from the landlord does not have the right to distrain for arrears having arisen prior to the date of the bankruptcy, uh, the date of the assignment. And I, I just raised for a question without seeking to answer it just for the moment. Uh, but what happens if a landlord assigns the lease, which almost always is the case, assigns the lease as security for its realty mortgage financing, uh, and uh, and then seeks to distrain? Uh, and I don't know whether under those circumstances. I'm not prepared to answer at this moment whether at that, under those circumstances the landlord's right of distress is good and is, is non-challengeable. Another problem with, bank, with, uh, with the right of distress is that there are conflicts in priorities which would often arise. In effect, a conditional vendor or less or of goods has priority, uh, properly registered on the PPSA, has priority over a distraining landlord. Uh, in respect of virtually all other secured creditors, uh, it's the guy with the, it's the Adidas remedy, the guy who has first access, the one who first seizes the goods has the, uh, has the priority. So that in an example, uh, a landlord, uh, a landlord distrains prior to a, a bank creditor under the PPSA distraining, the landlord has priority. In the event of bankruptcy, as I've already said to you, the distress is lost. So what does the, what does the secured creditor do on the occurrence of the, of the landlord's distress? It makes application, it petitions the tenant into bankruptcy. The date of the petition, as long as it occurs prior to the completion of the sale and application of the proceeds for arrears of rent, the, uh, the bankruptcy occurs prior to the, to the completion of the distress and the proceeds go to the, to the trustee and the trustee has to pay off or, re, or re, I recognize firstly the security of the secured creditor. So all that a secured creditor need do if he has been beaten to the goods by a landlord is petition the tenant into bankruptcy and then the, the, the situation has been reversed. The landlord is back under its remedies under the Landlord and Tenant Act. You have two questions? There are two questions? Sorry. Yes. As long as the lease has not been terminated prior to the occurrence of the bankruptcy, the rights of the trustee in bankruptcy to the lease are covered for the... The distress does not constitute termination of the lease. No, the distress, distress and termination of the lease may not occur together. Uh, and, uh, and I actually will deal with that just a little bit more in a moment, given the moment. There was a question back there? Yes. I'm sorry, did I, I said conditional vendor. I, I, it's, it's all PIMSIs that have priority over the land, making the assumption of proper perfection and registration and so on out of the PPSA. Big pardon? And, a title, and assuming that the PIMSI, uh, that, that, that there isn't a, and assuming that it's a true PIMSI, that is that there is, as Mr. Bennett says, a title reservation clause. Okay, now, uh, Another problem dealing with distress is the problem of facing the, the disagreeable tenant. And, and uh, you know, I had a very enjoyable experience. It had to do more with, uh, with termination than with distress, but it was the same problem of, of the recalcitrant, non-cooperative tenant. We ha I'm not going to use any names because it would sound uh, racially bigoted, but, uh, but they were, it was a distinctive ethnic surname of one tenant of a client of ours who, who was terrible tenant, terribly in arrears all of the time, messing up a shopping center horrible, like a really bad actor. So the landlord terminated and following the Posen method, he simply re-entered the premises and changed the locks. Returned the next morning to find the tenant back in, in uh, possession with a very strong crowbar, very big crowbar and, uh, and a very unwelcoming look to the landlord as to what to do. And, and in that result, my advice to the landlord was to re-enter 
put Doberman dogs in the premises and leave security guards there around the clock until the situation cooled out and a new tenant was, was put into the premises. The landlord didn't follow that route. Uh, they got hung up in litigation for about eight or 10 months. Uh, and, and in the result, the, the matter was settled because, uh, because, you, because the, I'm using the, my, the, my student's law for a gun if there is no schloss, it was easy for a really bad actor to, to stall out the proceedings for a very long time and it was just not going to be worth carrying on any further. About two years later, I received a call from a completely other client who, pardon? I'm sorry, from a completely other client who said, look, we have a situation with a tenant named X, and the X was the same surname, but a different first name uh, from, the first, from the first tenant that I just referred to. And he said, we're, we want to terminate the lease, but we're a little bit worried about this one because he's got a kind of a strange personality. I said, well, I'll tell you what, you're right, he's got a strange personality, and I know his brother, Mike, who is the first name of Mike, and I said, the way to terminate in the first place is to have two or three police officers standing by, some security guards with Dobermans, and re-enter the premises under those circumstances, and that's the only way it's going to work. In fact, they followed the advice, they re-entered the premises, and, they, and, and all of that, the police officers and the Dobermans were necessary. The tenant nonetheless applied for relief from forfeiture rather curiously, and that action uh, got stalled long enough that we had a new tenant in occupancy, and he finally dried up and went away. But uh, why, I guess, oh yes, I was referring to my, my point that you can't become involved in a breach of the peace when you're distraining. Um, okay, most of the material can sort of cover itself. I want, because, of the, because I'm already late with my time, uh, I want to deal with, uh, with the problem area, which has been partially alluded to here. So the typical way that a landlord in the folklore wants to deal with a defaulting tenant is to send in the bailiff. And the sending in the bailiff from the landlord's point of view means I've got back the goods, I've got the goods and I've got back the premises. Uh, and, uh, and the landlord says, okay, the goods are mine, I can sell them. And the landlord says, and then I will re-rent the premises and maybe I'll even get more money and it'll be okay with me to get rid of this guy. Well, as I've already said that in principle, you can't do that. You cannot both terminate and distrain. And if you send in the bailiff in those circumstances, that is by, and you, the bailiff changes the locks, even under the guise of seizing the goods which are inside, the case law is now relatively clear, and I will not admit that it's clear, clear, but it is relatively clear that that will have effected a termination of the lease even though what was purporting to have been done was a distress. If the lease has been terminated in that fashion, the distress is illegal and the, the tenant, the former tenant, is entitled to have his goods removed from the premises. Now, that's what the landlord's desire typically is to do both of those things. Um, now, for the reasons I've expressed, and I hope I've made it clear enough, you can't do both of them. But let me give some thoughts as to how to deal with that situation because the truth is the landlord wants rid of the guy and also wants to use the goods on the premises for security for the arrears of rent which have accrued to date. So under both of the cases and under virtually any properly drawn commercial lease, there is a provision which entitles a landlord in the event of a default to re-enter the premises without terminating the lease for the purpose of re-renting the premises. The landlord does that. He has entered, not for the purpose of distraining, but for the purpose of re-renting the premises. The lease is still on foot. The lease is still on foot. My submission is that the landlord can, while he's on the premises anyway, distrain against the goods which are there, go through the distress procedure, wait the five days, and by the way, follow all the formalities, wait five days, get the goods appraised and sell them. And then, if, there, if the arrears have not been fully paid, uh, the landlord could at that point terminate, uh, he could carry on without terminating and re-rent the premises. Notwithstanding the cases, uh, and I say that it's relatively clear, and Frank will tell me I am certain that it is very clear, uh, but my submission is that if a landlord re-enters the premises by, ch I'm sorry, distrains the goods and in the course of doing so causes the lock to be changed for the purpose of securing the goods which are on the premises, uh, provided that the landlord makes it clear that and in fact permits the tenant to have access to the premises at all times when it wishes to for the purpose perhaps of conducting its business, then the landlord is, in a, it seems to me, in a position 
uh, of controlling both of the premises and the goods. It's not a very practical solution because you have to be there all of the time, and there are case law problems, I have to warn you, but it is, at least from my point of view, a thought. Another, I think, and my favorite way of dealing with this problem is, is to distrain enough to pay most of the arrears, not all of them, and subsequently terminate for the balance of the, of the arrears which are in default. The Posen method, this is Posen method two, um, is if the landlord wants uh, both to sell the goods for the arrears and to have the premises back. And this is most especially, this is a particularly important kind of a thing to do when the landlord wants to use the goods which are on the premises for the next tenant who will occupy the premises, such for example as a restaurateur. restaurateur. The first thing to do is, and this is the Posen method, the first thing to do is, is to line up all of the appraisers, uh, the, both of the appraisers in advance, and a buyer and a new tenant. Prearrange by clandestine means, and it's not hard to do, the, am the amounts of the appraisals. The appraisers can go and have lunch in this restaurant and take a look around and they can pretty much come to what their valuation is going to be. Enter into conditional agreements of purchase and sale with the buyer of those goods for that appraised value. Enter into a conditional agreement to lease, and the only reason I'm saying conditional is, and nobody should except this little group of us privately here know that these are conditional agreements because you don't want as landlord to have any liability in case all of this gets overturned, which some unwise court might one day do. All right, now all of that has happened, and so far the tenant doesn't know anything except he's had some strange new customers in his restaurant. You then distrain by sending in a bailiff to do something innocuous like posting up a notice somewhere in some prominent place which the tenant will immediately remove and tag the goods or get the tenant's acknowledgement rather benignly that the tenant acknowledges that the distress is a good distress and that it won't disturb the goods which are there. And on the morning of the sixth day, you remember I said, you have to wait five days until the, uh, after the distress, after the seizure, before the appraisers are, appraisals are done. So on the morning of the sixth day, distress not being able to be done uh, well, I guess the distress has already occurred, but I think you should stay out of day. I think you should still conduct yourself during daylight hours. So at six or seven o'clock in the morning, depending on the time of the year, you can attend at the premises early one morning, or sometimes if you want the fun of it, do it when the tenant is already there. Attend with the bailiff, the appraisers, the uh, purchaser, the new tenant, and everybody's lawyers, and the whole group of you walk on in. And within, I would say, a properly orchestrated ten minutes of conduct. The appraisals can be completed, the, don't forget the five days has already passed, the appraisals can be completed, the sale can be completed, the agreement of, per, the, the sale already completed, the, the uh, new tenant can be put into possession of the premises, the locks can be changed, the new tenant given the locks, and uh, that's making the assumption, by the way, that the, that the realization on the sale of those chattels did not fully pay the arrears. So you want to carefully orchestrate your arrears as well to make sure that what you're selling pays about 90 or 95 percent of them and then put the, tenant, the new tenant into possession and say to the, uh, to the previous tenant, uh, hurry home, you're moving, in the words of Mr. Gazzi, and, and that's the end of it. Now, that to me is the only way of being able to uh, effectively make use of the distress if you're going to run into any problems. If you're not going to run into problems, distress can be a leverage method, but not a real final, I don't think, solution. Okay, before distraining, uh, before distraining, and this goes to the question of preparation, you have to, before deciding anything of what, uh, any remedy to pursue, you want to know what the situation is. So you perform all of your searches, bankruptcy search, PPSA, CSRA, Section 178 of the Bank, Bank Act searches, and even a realty search to see whether the lease has been, uh, has been turned over. If it's a retail tenant, you know whether, if it's a retail tenant paying percentage rent, you know what the sales are because you've been getting phony sales statements uh, from the tenant. I'm sorry, just sales statements from the tenant. So you know whether, you can calculate relatively easily whether the place is making money or it is not. And you then decide whether, what the best course of action to follow is. The for the client, under the circumstances, he needs to know all of those things to know where he's likely headed in order to know whether what he really wants is the goods or what he really wants is the premises. Because depending on the circumstances, those, the answer to both of those may be different. Somebody said before, the premises are worth a whole lot more to the landlord because he can rent it for a higher rent than the distress, than the distrained goods then don't worry about the distrained goods because you're going to run into a problem if there is a bankruptcy. If the, prem if the premises are what's important to the landlord, forget everything else, just terminate the lease because otherwise if there's going to be an intervening bankruptcy, the control over those premises will go to the trustee in bankruptcy in answer to your question. 
Uh, and if you want the premises, you have to do it effectively, quickly, prior to the occurrence of a bankruptcy. A distress itself could trigger the bankruptcy because, as I said before, the tenant might end up assigning himself into bankruptcy. Uh, and this, that's not un uncommon because the tenant's principal, as you can appreciate, probably has guaranteed the, uh, the principal of any loans, for example, to the bank, has guaranteed to the loans to the bank as well as giving the bank security. So it's in the tenant's interest to make sure the bank gets looked after in the event this thing fails. So if you do distrain, the tenant looking after its own interest is going to make an assignment in bankruptcy. And then, as I said before, you've lost, under that, in, in that scenario, you've lost both of the goods and the premises. The trustee has taken control. Now, I don't know whether I've done this in an orderly enough fashion or not, but what I've tried to paint out for you is that in the case of a difficult situation, distress is not all that rewarding an experience. You can't have both the goods and the premises. You can lose both the goods and the premises and be left to your remedies as a, as a, as a, uh, as a creditor uh, under the Bankruptcy Act, which is preferred to some extent and then only ordinary. So, in, And because normally these guarantees have been given uh, and uh, to a secured creditor, and you don't want to uh, end up putting yourself into the disadvantageous position that I've discussed, and because of this, and uh, this is another posen rule that, that, I, uh, that has not gained very much sway in the, in the economic market and may be a little bit problematic, but if you look at what a situation is with a landlord and a tenant, the landlord is truly a creditor of the tenant. The landlord is granting a whole lot of, of credit to the tenant. Over the term of a lease, it may be considerably more credit that is being granted to the uh, land, that is being extended by the landlord than by the so-called secured creditor, by the bank. Uh, so therefore, may I suggest consideration be given to, and I really don't want you to do this because it's, I think it's something I'd rather be the only one who does, but, but I think you should give some thought to actually making the landlord a secured creditor. That is, as part of the arrangements that you make between landlord and tenant, obtain a security agreement between landlord and tenant to secure the tenant's obligations under the lease. Now, the tenant, as a practical matter, will say, yeah, but then I'm not going to be able to finance my business operation. So at least what that will flush out is uh, an understanding as to what the tenant really needs to finance its business operation as contemplated at the beginning of the lease. The landlord can decide whether it does or doesn't want the tenant under those circumstances. Assuming it does, it's not really very hard. It's, hard because, it's not really very hard to effect an orderly a uh, three-party agreement among tenant, landlord, and other secured creditor as to the ordering of priorities, who gets what, who's ahead of whom, for how much, and so on, uh, that would at least put the landlord in a position beyond its rights as landlord uh, for distress and so on. It puts the landlord in a position of having, A, learned a lot of information, and B, probably putting itself in a position where it can have a position as a secured creditor as well as a distraining landlord. And, uh, it's rather fun to work out those three-party agreements. The reason people, I think, don't do it is because it's an inconvenience because all clients and most lawyers want to do is get the deal done, close the file, and bill the file out. Um, but I think that there are times when at least an investigation into the question as to, uh, the, as to what the landlord's position is going to be in the event of, uh, of a default, I think gives some serious thought to becoming a secured creditor. Well, listen, I guess I talked too much because I ran long, but not longer than was my allotted time, just the exact amount of time. But there also were no questions. And I guess, although it's coffee time 10 or 15 minutes ago, are there any quick questions that we can take? With little less, I'm sorry? <laughs> Just so you'll know, I did know the answer to the question, but my coach says 
the best value you can get. The best value you can get comes from, and I forget which section, it's in the 30s somewhere under the Landlord and Tenant Act, that says, that says that the landlord distraining is required to get the best price that it can get. So among the choices that you offered, my view about it is the liquidation value. Um, the, wholesale va the wholesale value may even be way too much uh, because you may not be able to realize the wholesale value on what it is that you're seizing. It's what can be reasonably expected to be obtained by the, by the distraining landlord and the person to properly ask that of uh, is uh, you've got two appraisers, they should both be knowledgeable in this area and they'll both be able to tell you within a very close amount how much money they can get for the sale of those items and it's that value that you're talking about. Okay, anything else? Thank you. Steve, I would like to make uh, one comment. And this morning's uh, Globe and Mail. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say it's public knowledge. I was reading it on the way down this morning. But uh, there's an advertisement in there by Touche Ross Limited of the sale as a going concern of 14 fast food restaurants. It's the assets of the Great Canadian Soup Company, um, a division of PNR Food Industries in bankruptcy. This is the classic case of who you act for, whether it's a landlord, a tenant, trustee, or receiver. But in this case, obviously, we have not only a bankruptcy, but a receiver and a receivership. And obviously, no landlords terminated the leases prior to uh, the, the act of bankruptcy. Therefore, the trustee has a right now to assign the balance of the unexpired term. And for a lease, for example, in the first Canadian place, it would be very valuable. At least perhaps in, um, in Sudbury, not as valuable. So it can be an asset of a debtor, it can be an asset of a trustee in bankruptcy, it can be an asset of a secured creditor, in this case probably a bank, I would imagine, who put in the receiver and manager. Yes? Well, the right to assign the leases is, is, uh, is covered somewhat this afternoon. It's, it's under Section 38, I think, as you know, of the Landlord and Tenant Act. And it's really the trustee who steps into the shoes of the debtor as the statutory assignee and exercises the right to assign the balance of the unexpired term. And because of that, he becomes prima facie liable on the covenant to a landlord. Uh, trustees have in the past and will in the future negotiate without personal liability there is a decision of our registrar in bankruptcy who has held that notwithstanding the um, covenant uh, that a trustee in bankruptcy is not liable if there's a subsequent default by the new tenant, if you will. Last, uh, if I may just add a little bit, Frank, to that. I guess I can. Just adding a little bit to that, Frank, uh, that case, which I didn't know was advertised this morning's Globe, but is a rather interesting one because it does show a couple of things. Firstly, the only reason effectively uh, for, the, uh, for the tenant to have made an assignment in bankruptcy, which is I think what happened in that case, uh, is in order to preserve the assets out of the hands of the landlords. It's, it's precisely to take the leases out of control of the landlords um, in order to be able to have them as a realization, for, as an asset for realization. Uh, to produce money to pay off secured creditors where the secured creditors have personal guarantees, which is the case in that situation. There was a case of 14 landlords as creditors who didn't move in time, as Bernie Gazzi would say, and terminate the lease so they don't have to expose the balance of the unexpired terms to the marketplace. In, in that case, I don't think the landlords should be faulted for their carelessness too much because, in fact, the leases, I think, primarily were all, I think all were, or almost all, were up to date as of May. So the, and the, the insolvency arises from circumstances other than the leases. So in that particular case, the landlords really had very little choice. Uh, but there were a couple of weeks where a landlord really sitting on top of it, uh, there were a couple of weeks where the landlords could very well have, have grabbed the premises in colloquial language by terminating the leases. We're gonna have a short coffee break. We've run a little over time. So uh, would you hurry back in about seven or eight minutes? Yeah. Permission course, we're already into the uh, third, if not the fourth day of getting into the rights and remedies of secured transactions. Um, this area, the next area, is, is covered by uh, Martin Stambler, uh, mortgage remedies. Uh, Martin is a partner with the uh, London law firm of Richmond, Stambler and Mills. 
Martin was uh, formerly a senior instructor in the uh, bar admission course, uh, creditors and debtors rights for many years, as well as lectured on uh, mortgage remedies to the uh, special lectures way back in the early 70s, and is a uh, very prolific writer in this area of law, as well as a, one of the leading practitioners west of Toronto in mortgage remedies. Uh, Martin, has, uh, Martin has prepared a, a very comprehensive uh, checklist uh, which appears in the materials and is also uh, was kind enough to uh, review uh, my chapter on mortgage remedies that appears in the bar admission course text. While uh, Steve Posen was gracious enough to say read the materials and uh, Martin May as well and others, um, I make no royalties. I signed away my royalties to the Law Society, so I uh, take no credit for that. Martin, there please. Royalties? I never got any royalties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, I intend to deal briefly with uh, mortgage remedies generally, and then I would like to go through the power of sale procedure uh, to show the, to just highlight the pitfalls in that area. Um, along the way, if I can deal with mortgagors' rights to reinstatement, I will. And I will hopefully leave enough time to answer some questions. And I invite you to, it's a fairly intimate group, so I invite you to chip in and, as the others have and, and uh, participate and ask me questions if you wish. I am very strongly of the view that most of the questions that arise with mortgage remedies derive from a basic lack of knowledge of the very fundamental ideas dealing with the remedies. In other words, there, there are five actions that a mortgagee can take. Everyone may be familiar with them, but I encourage you to reread the basics of them because really most of the questions I've ever seen asked are solved by a, a restatement of the basic fundamental fundamentals of those remedies. As you know, there's the action for payment, which is a simple money debt based on getting a money judgment and suing without regard to the security. Secondly, there's the right to possession, which is entering into the control of the secured property for purposes of deriving a rent or turning it over to a purchaser, and also for purposes of, as you, you'll see under section 22, locking in an acceleration. Thirdly, there's the action for foreclosure, which uh, turns over the, uh, extinguishes the equity of redemption and creates an absolute title in the mortgagee. And fourthly, judicial sale. And lastly, power of sale. Five remedies, they can be each of them taken independently and in schedule in the schedule B to my checklist, I have listed the various sequences that you can take of one or the other and how they may blend. So I leave that to you to see how they can be uh, sequenced. Uh, but each one could be taken independently. Although usually, the action for payment is combined with an action for possession. Usually. All three are combined in a foreclosure or judicial sale. Now, this, let me just mention a, a bit on each one of those very quickly to give their fundamental distinctions. Because as I say, that it, to me it's critical in, in reviewing those, and I constantly review those in my mind the, 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 uh, while I'm thinking of the subject, not constantly. Um, and uh, it, 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 it behooves us to do that while you're considering these problems. In connection with payment, the action for payment, Section 90, 19 of the Mortgages Act 
gives you a right to sue someone who hasn't signed the mortgage, the present registered owner. So you have an option to sue the original mortgagor. You have the option to sue anyone who has signed an assumption agreement along the way. And you have a right against the existing registered owner with whom there is no privity of contract. The kicker here is you've got to choose between the one or the other. You have an option at the time of judgment to elect against the present registered owner or the uh, original mortgagor. Once you get judgment against one, you've lost against the other. So right at the initial uh, considerations for an action, you've got to decide who you want to sue because once you've gone down the course and accepted judgment on one, you may regret it if he has no assets and uh, should have sued the other. There is some, and I'll just mention it, there is, a, there is a, an issue that has been going through our courts as to whether the original mortgagor will be released uh, or if he's prejudiced by the conduct of the mortgagee in dealing with the property. In other words, whether the original mortgagor becomes merely a guarantor. And I think that under the current, uh, the current law and the current state of the standard mortgages, uh, you can pretty well um, uh, take it at that the position is that the original mortgagor will remain liable and is not as a primary debtor and will not be released uh, as a guarantor. So the, the action is open against him. I've mentioned, uh, uh, just mentioning p possession as the second item. Possession can be taken as... Uh, as uh, Mr. Posen uh, indicated, and one of the ways is by self-help. You can just go in and uh, if the property is abandoned and you can, uh, and you can take, take possession without um, obstruction or resistance, you can simply change the locks and take possession. Um, you can return the rents and take control of the property. And if you deprive the mortgagor of the control of the property, you are in possession by being in possession of the rents. And, of course, you can have a judgment for possession and have the sheriff uh, obtain possession for you. Frank mentioned that foreclosure is a passe remedy. Well, but it's still available. And there are one or two instances when foreclosure is an appropriate remedy. Uh, one is when title is needed. When the mortgagee needs to have title, for example, if he's a second mortgagee and you need title to renew with the first mortgagee. The first mortgagee doesn't want to renew with somebody who doesn't have title to, uh, to bind the property. So you may need to extinguish the title of the mortgage or where you need to renew. Or if you need for ultimate recovery, um, you need to do capital improvements or uh, uh, refinance the property, you'll need title for that. So that uh, in those circumstances, foreclosure may be an appropriate remedy. The other area where foreclosure is, is important or resorting to the courts is important where you have a complex property and it's difficult to market and the mortgagee doesn't want to take the responsibility and expose himself to the risk of a self-help remedy. Foreclosure then uh, uh, may be resorted to and should be resorted to uh, uh, to, to uh, relieve the mortgagee of the responsibility of the process. And that applies for judicial sale as well. Now this is particularly so.